Hey everyone, welcome back and thank you for joining us again in our next discussion of statistics. The next topic then will be to find these population and sample standard deviations, but now using our calculators. The idea here is if we just need to get the result and we're doing analysis on the result, we can bypass a lot of that by hand math. The emphasis on the by hand math was we're taking stats as a math class, so it's our job to explain all the math that's going on behind the scenes as opposed to just using a calculator. So let's go back to the travel times from the examples that we've been working with. This would be the full population of our seven pieces of data. We're going to go ahead and throw that into L1 again if you don't already have it there still. And then we're going to use the one var stats function again like we did when we found means. Just in case you don't remember how to show that, let's head over to the calculator. I've got my data in L1 again. We don't need to work with L2 and L3 because we're not doing the by hand math. Instead, we're going to hit stat and we want to arrow over to calc so it brings up all those programs. One var stats is the program we're looking for. So go ahead and hit enter. When I do one var stats, I'm going to hit second and then L1 because we want our calculator to find the one var stats of L1. Hit enter and it spits out all this beautiful information yet again, like we've seen previously. What we're looking for right now would be the values of S sub X and sigma sub X going on. Those would be our standard deviations. This is why it's so important to make sure we know that sigma is the population standard deviation and S is the sample standard deviation. Referring back to our notes and repeating one more time, the population standard deviation is sigma and our calculators told us that was approximately 11.36 like we found by hand previously, while the sample standard deviation would be S where we found that value to be a 12.27. Keeping in mind, this is the sample standard deviation of the entire group of seven pieces of data, not using the four values of data that we did in the previous example. Just to repeat one more time, Using our one var stats function, we get both sigma and s, just making sure we know sigma is population standard deviation and s is sample standard deviation. And now we know how to get our standard deviations using our calculator. Let's go ahead and apply that to the next example to create a bit of a comparison. Now for this example, we have scores of six different stat students and how they did on their first exam. They tell us to treat the scores as a population and then find the standard deviation, which means we're trying to find sigma. We're going to take the calculator approach on this one like we said previously. For the sake of notes, we'll go ahead and write down the steps that we're doing. And that means step number one, we're going to input our data into our calculators and for the sake of changing it up, I'm going to throw this data into L2 just so we can leave that other data in L1. After that, we'll run our one var stats program, this time of L2 just to create that example. And after we get our one var stats, we should get our answer of sigma, which was approximately 11.16. Showing that on our calculator real quick though. I'm going to hit stat, go into edit one more time, and put all our data into L2. Once we have our data in L2, we could go ahead and hit stat, arrow over to calc again, one var stats, but this time make sure you're careful. We want to do the one var stats of second and then two to get our L2. Hit enter to generate our results. And again, we get our sample standard deviation and our population standard deviation. But remember, they've told us to find our population standard deviation, which would be our 11.16. And that means we're all set with our population standard deviation. Jumping quickly to part B, they're saying now treat the scores as a sample and find the standard deviation of the test scores. In terms of steps, that means we're still going to input our data into L2, but we already have it. Just writing that as notes as if we were starting from the beginning. And then run our one var stats function again. Going back to our calculator where we still have our results. Remember sample standard deviation is represented by S which means we already have our value of S, the sample standard deviation, and it's approximately 12.22. And we're all set finding the sample standard deviation this time of our data. The idea of this example though is to compare sigma versus S. For both parts A and B, we were using the same data, yet sigma and S provide different results. This is all based on the principle of degrees of freedom. That is, degrees of freedom refers to the n minus one while finding the sample standard deviation. Just to refresh, remember when we found population standard deviation, we were dividing by the population size, capital N, as opposed to when we found sample standard deviation, we were dividing our sum by n minus one and referring to our sample size now. We call n minus one the degrees of freedom because the first n minus one observations meaning all of our data except for the last piece of data have the quote freedom to be whatever they wish to be. 
However, the last value, which is our nth value, has no freedom. The nth value would be the value of a number that forces the sum of the deviations about the mean to equal zero. It cancels out all the deviations away from the mean. This is way deeper than what we need to go, but just presenting the idea of why we have an n minus one as opposed to just an n when finding our two different types of standard deviations. And now that we've covered the idea of standard deviations from both a population and a sample, let's go back to our Wendy's and McDonald's data. Now they're asking us which data has a larger standard deviation and how do you know? Well remember previously we said that the McDonald's data is more dispersed. So the overall idea here is more dispersed data results in a larger standard deviation. And that takes us to our next objective where we need to determine the variance of a variable from raw data. Now we've already covered the hard part. The variance of a variable is simply the square of the standard deviation. Remember the standard deviation of the population is sigma, so the population variance is literally just sigma squared. The sample standard deviation we know is s, so that means the sample variance would be s squared. Jumping into a quick little example then, we previously computed the standard deviation of the travel times to work for all seven employees of the web company that we were discussing. Remember we found sigma to be at 11.36. That means the population variance, sigma squared, would be 11.36 squared. And we end up with a population variance of a 129.05. With that same idea, let's say we were told to treat the data as a sample. The sample standard deviation was a 12.27. So that means our sample variance then would be a 12.27 squared, which gives us a 150.55. Continuing on to our next objective then, we're introducing a big idea here that is the empirical rule. This plays a role in future sections as well. This is a big overarching idea though in stats. First, we have to make sure that this is the case. If a distribution is roughly bell-shaped, then the following things hold. But again, the emphasis is we have to be told or know that we have a bell-shaped distribution. If we do have a bell-shaped distribution, then approximately 68% of the data will lie within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% of the data will lie within two standard deviations of the mean, and 99.7% of the data will lie within three standard deviations of the mean. Thinking of this as a concept, almost 100% of our data will lie within three standard deviations of our mean value if we have a bell-shaped distribution. Note that we can also use the empirical rule based on sample data with x bar as opposed to mu, meaning it applies to both samples and population data. The graph that we see is this overarching image of our empirical rule, breaking down each section according to percentage of data based on the standard deviations. That is, the number 68% comes from the idea that 34% of the data would be from mu to mu plus sigma, and another 34% would be from mu to mu minus sigma. So we're adding sigma, the standard deviation, or subtracting sigma, the standard deviation, to create these different intervals within our bell-shaped distribution. Well, let's go ahead and jump to an example to see the advantage of knowing our empirical rule. We're told the following data represent the cholesterol levels of the 54 female patients of a family doctor. Now I'm gonna go on a tangent real quick. Notice that the statement said of the 54 patients. That means we're working with a population because these are all of our patients. The 54, not 54 randomly selected patients. Just a side topic. Back to our example though. We're told that the data has a bell-shaped distribution, which is a big deal to us. As soon as we see this in the question, we immediately want to be thinking, oh, okay, bell-shaped distribution. That means empirical rule can apply if they ask me something. Then they tell us that we have a mean value of a 57.4 and a standard deviation of 11.7. Heading to part A, according to the empirical rule, which is a big deal again, they're asking us to determine the percentage of all patients that have serum HDL within three standard deviations of the mean. Think about what this means. You're looking at this as an exam. You've got this intimidating big chunk of data looking at you and you're thinking, no way do I have to actually put all this in my calculator or something. Well, in fact, we don't. Since it says according to the empirical rule, we get to find what percentage of the data is within three standard deviations of the mean. Well, what does your empirical rule say? Since they told us to use the empirical rule and we have a bell-shaped distribution, that means no math is needed. We know that 99.7% of the data is within three standard deviations of the mean. And that's it, we have our answer. Now let's jump down to part B then. 
They're still telling us to use the empirical rule, but now they want us to determine the percentage of all patients again that have a level between 34 and 69.1. That means we need to find these specific values on our distribution. We have the distribution drawn for us already. We know we have a bell-shaped distribution and we get to apply the empirical rule. So this is the image we need to be prepared to create on an exam. So as we go to build this distribution, the first thing we want to recognize is they gave us the value of mu and the value of sigma. We were told that mu is a 57.4 and sigma is an 11.7. Remember our distribution, mu is there at the center in a bell-shaped distribution. And after we have our 57.4 in the center of our distribution, we can apply the standard deviation by adding and subtracting it from the mean to get our other key points. That is, the next line in our graph, our key value of x, would be 69.1 because we go 57.4 plus an 11.7. Now you can keep going to the right, but that's the key value we were looking for. They asked us to find the percentage between 34 and 69.1, so we have one key value to the right of the mean, or the value that is greater than the mean, and now we just need to figure out how many standard deviations away from the mean is the value of 34. Well, our mean minus sigma would be 57.4 minus 11.7 to get a 45.7. And then we need to subtract that value of sigma one more time. Mu minus 2 sigma, that is, would give us our 34, and we're all set. That is, to find the percentage of all patients that have a serum HDL between 34 and 69.1, we are adding up the percentages that fall between our lower and upper limits. That is... The answer to our question, that percentage would be our 13.5% plus a 34% plus a 34%, giving us a total of 81.5%. And continuing to part C with the same principle here, according to the empirical rule, determine the percentage of all patients that have serum HDL greater than 69.1. 69.1 is still our key point here, but they're asking us to find greater than 69.1 which means on our graph, we're looking at these sections. 69.1 forms our lower limit. We need to add up the percentages to the right of that mark in order to find the percentage the question is asking for. Therefore, our percentage would be a 13.5% plus a 2.35% plus a 0.15% to give us our total percentage of a 16%. And we're all set with our application of the empirical rule. And heading into an extra example then, because the empirical rule is such a big deal, we've got a random sample of 30 stats exams from a previous semester. They give us the mean score yet again of a 72.1, and they tell us that they have a standard deviation of 4.3. The distribution of the exams is known to be approximately bell-shaped, and of course that's a huge deal for us. As soon as we see that, we're thinking empirical rule. They ask us to determine the approximate percentage of exams. Again, highlighting that, we're asked to find a percentage of these exams, and then the specific values are given to us, or that percentage we're looking for would be the exams greater than our 80.7. Building our distribution again, just like mu, we know x bar belongs in the middle of our distribution. So we have x bar at a 72.1, and since we're looking for the scores that are greater than an 80.7, I'm going to find the key values to the right or greater than our mean. Well, our first key point then would be x bar plus s, our sample standard deviation, so 72.1 plus 4.3. Again, 4.3 coming from the problem, given our standard deviation. That gives us our value of 76.4. The next key point for us would be x bar plus 2 s to get our 80.7. Again, that's the key point that we're looking for. That means to answer the question, the percentage of exams, we can find by adding those two values of the percentages from our distribution. That is our percentage, would be a 2.35% plus a 0.15%, and the percentage of exams with scores greater than 80.7 is 2.5%. And we've got part A. Now part B asks us a different type of question. They're asking you, do you know how to find the percentages, and do you also know how to apply the empirical rule? They don't give us the values. Instead, they say about 95% of scores. Well, we need to remember that 95% is a key number for us, that is, 95% of our data we know will lie within two standard deviations, so within 2 times s. That means going back to our distribution, we need to find the values of two standard deviations that are less than the mean now. So I get 67.8 by taking x bar minus s, and then I get 63.5 by taking x bar minus 2s. Again, from your empirical rule, 
we know 95% of the data fall within two standard deviations. And what you just did was found the key points where that occurs, the value that are 63.5 and 80.7. So our answer is just that, between 63.5 and 80.7. Keeping in mind, those are the test scores. So they're asking us for values of x, not percentages, just to make sure we keep that in context. And finally, on to part C. We're asked about 68% of scores will lie between what two scores? It's the same principle as previously discussed. 68% is a key number for us with the empirical rule. We need to know that 68% of our data will fall within one standard deviation. So if we see that, we're able to interpret. Heading back to our distribution then, just showing similar to before, now we're talking about within one standard deviation. And we know 68% is within one standard deviation. Therefore, our lower value would be a 67.8, and our upper value would be a 76.4, which means we have our answer for part C, and we're all set.